described himself in the past as accidentally Algerian. Filmmaker Karim Ainouiz was born and raised in Brazil, but was always intrigued by his father's birthplace in the mountains of Kabylia. For this latest film, the director went on a personal journey to an unknown country and a new cinematic landscape. We caught up with him here in Cannes to find out more. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, your My film pleasure. is screening here in Cannes, Mariner of the Mountains. It's a very personal film, charting your journey to Algeria for the first time, the birthplace of your father, and you document what you see there. But watching the film, it almost feels like it's more about your mother. Can you explain that? Yeah, it is about searching for a fatherland, you know, in that sense. So Algeria is that fatherland. and. Um, it is told to my mother, so I think there is a feeling that, that she's always present and that she's sort of this absent character who's always there sort of, you know, with me. It's a very personal film, but I think the biggest challenge of making this film, how can you make something personal that's yet relevant to others, you know? It's coming from a very interesting moment in history, you know, the 1960s, a lot of hope there was in the 1960s, a lot of changes were there, and the fact that an Algerian man meets a Brazilian woman in the middle of the United States is something very specific of that moment, you know, and so it is, I think it's about them, but it's also about um, that time and it's about colonialism and the fight against colonialism allow them to meet and shape the history of their love and of my life. Sema, minha companheira imaginária. São 7h58 da manhã do dia que eu avistei a Argel pela primeira vez. And you point out in the film that on arrival in Algeria, you didn't have to spell your family name for the first time, that name that set you and your mother apart in Brazil. And it does raise that possibility of an alternative destiny. What would have happened if you'd all stayed in Algeria? Yeah. I don't regret anything I have lived. Sometimes I miss things I haven't lived. And I think, I, I just kept thinking I was, when I was becoming an adult. When I was younger, it was different, but it was more of an adult. Like, what would it have been to be growing up in a country? Because I think what happens in, in North Africa, particularly in Algeria, and, but in all the African countries and around the world, you know, the wars of liberation from colonial powers, there is this blossoming of utopia in the 1960s. In Algeria, it was after 62 until let's say more or less 74, which are the golden, a golden years of the revolution. So I've kept wondering what would it have been to have been in a country that was so much fun, that there was so much joy, there was so much hope, you know, and having the opposite experience of have living in, you know, and being raised and growing up in a country that was all about the opposite, you know, because Algeria is independent in 62 and the military is coming to power in Brazil in 1964. So I was actually raised in a dictatorship. Eu espero um tempão, não fundo. Na minha vez, eu mostro o passaporte para o funcionário. Ele pergunta meu nome. Ele entendeu de primeira. Foi a primeira vez na vida que eu não precisei só letrar meu nome. Ele pergunta para onde eu tô indo. Eu falo que eu vou passar por Argel e que depois eu vou para Cabilha. Ele fica desconfiado, pergunta se eu tenho parente na cabilha. Eu mudo de assunto e eu digo que eu sou um jornalista fazendo uma reportagem para a televisão brasileira. Ele ri e pergunta se eu conheço Zidane. And as well as your personal family history, this film is also a bit of a snapshot of contemporary Algeria by the encounters yeah. in the street that you have, the conversations, the observations yeah. you make. From that contact with the local people, what was your overriding impression about what they had to say to you? Listen, I think that there is um, a sense of pride, which was great. I remember being in Cuba and having that same sensation. There's a sense of like, this is ours. We've earned it, you know? So that was very beautiful. Um, there's also a sense of um, wanting things to change. And I think that was very interesting. 
it was not in the movie, but the time I was in Algeria was at the same time where this, the uprises for the change of the regime started, you know, in, in 2019. It's called Iraq, which means the movement in Arabic. So it was really beautiful to see this country that had earned its history, and you feel very much that when you talk to older people, you know, like, this is a country that we've earned, this is our place, and this place had been stolen from us, and now it's back in our hands. And at the same time, when you see the new generation, it's been 50 years, and certain things have been mismanaged, other things have been fine, you know, and so I think that there's this sense of, they need change, and they need to liberate themselves from this weight, you know, that there is from this such, beautiful but bloody um, past. Indeed, when you arrived in early 2019, there was a youth uprising happening in Algeria and your project, you got a little distracted by what was happening in Algeria. Yeah. You met a woman called Narges, I believe, yeah. and followed her, made a film with yeah. her. What was it that was so compelling about her and what she was doing? Listen, I think it was, it was mind-blowing to not have been in a country which was somehow mine for 54 years and then I get there and three, literally three days later it's the first demonstration that takes over the streets of Algiers but also around the country and I was, I was blown away by it because again you know it's these feelings of oh my god I wish this was happening also in Brazil you know with, with what's happening there that people could take the streets and could claim for something else and so I was very much moved by it and then I decided along with Marion of the Mountains there's a, a company piece which is called Narges A, which is this other documentary that I did and I was there completely shot on my smartphone, where I followed this woman. I didn't know much about her. It was much more about her charisma and also the fact that I wanted to follow somebody through the, um, through the demonstrations. And then what I found out at the end is that she was actually embodying the history of what I just told you in the last 15 minutes, you know? She, her grandparents were freedom fighters, her father was somehow troubled with the new regime and there she was out in the streets you know um, claiming and shouting and and, um, and reclaiming her own history Political discontent is something that today is uh, bubbling up in Brazil, your country as well, that we've yeah. seen thousands take to the streets in various cities against the current government. Do you think we're on the verge of major change there? I hope we're on the verge of major change. I feel like certain urge for change, you know, and I think what happened now in the last year, it's just the proof of it. You know, like we're just getting to a limit of a, of a system that is leaving a lot of people outside, leaving a lot of people frustrated, leaving a lot of people angry. Uh, it was interesting when I was making Narges last year, you know, there were things happening in Chile, there were things happening in Hong Kong. They don't have necessarily anything to do with each other, but there is something in the air, which is a different virus maybe, which is a virus that's like claiming for change, it's claiming for social justice, and it's claiming for equality. I think the, most aber the biggest aberration during the pandemic, besides what we've been through and the deaths and the loss, is how much the rich people became richer. And that's, that's a huge problem, you know, and I think that's also a huge source of anger for a lot of people. Looking at the cultural landscape in Brazil, things are very complicated there. The Cinematheque's been closed for a year and other institutions are suffering. Yeah. But at international events like Cannes, Brazilian artists are well represented by yourself, Cleber yeah. Mendonça Filho in the jury, Anita yeah. Rocha da Silveira in the director's fortnight here. Is that the solution, being an artist in exile? I think that what's under the surface, yes, yes, a lot of people either have changed, especially people who work in cinema, either they have changed um, field, the field of work, so they're working something else, either they're sort of, you know, providing services for big streamers, or they're leaving, and I think that um, none of those three things are good things that are happening, you know? so I think despite the fact that we're here, it's a small presence, and I think it is a presence that's also a very strong gesture of the Cannes Film Festival, which is not only a film festival, but it's also a festival of culture, of politics, of inclusion, of diversity, to have us here, but it's actually, compared to the other years, is much less. A lot of us couldn't come here because of the pandemic. A lot of us couldn't come here because of financial issues, you know, there's no support anymore. So I think um, it's also good to look a little bit under the radar to understand that the situation is very, very dire.
Last time you were here in Cannes, you won the Ansata Hagar Prize for Invisible Life, that beautiful melodrama about the sisters uh, Euridice and Gida. You have form with strong female characters, and I believe your next project is yeah. focusing on a historical one, Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's yeah. final wife. Can you tell us a bit more about what drew you to that? Sure, I think it was the fact that I want also to have new adventures and new challenges in my work. I've been making films for 25 years, and I thought, it would be interesting to kind of understand what it is to make a movie in a language that's not mine, but it's a language that's widely accessible and, you know, English, which is also a language that I've been speaking for so many years. But beyond that, I think what really attracted me was that context and the character. And I think what really, really, really blew me away with Catherine is like her resilience, which is something that I cherish very much in anyone, despite of it's being a man and a woman, Brazilian or not. Her re resilience against a guy who has always been portrayed as this incredible monarch, but who actually was a really cruel man, you know. And also the fact that she was very much interested in education, you know. She published the first book in England. She educated Elizabeth, who became, unquote, a great monarch. I don't know if it's a great monarch is a good thing or not, but she became an incredible figure in, in English history and world history. So. I was interested in this combination, how she had this, this strength, you know, to, to you know, it's, we talk about the wives that Henry killed or got their heads cut off, but we don't talk about the one. Well, we're excited to see it when it does finally come out. Thank you. Karim, I know thank you so much for your time. <laughs>